Hello, everybody, and a warm welcome to this uh, today's webinar, uh, which is uh, co-held by Altus IT, SFC Energy, and uh, Flowline. Uh, so I'm happy to see that we have so many participants today. Um, today's uh, webinar will be about sewer and uh, surface uh, water flow measurement in uh, remote areas, and we have two speakers today. Uh, first of all, uh, is going to start Mark Davies. A um, little bit about Mark. He has been working in the flow metering industry for over 26 years, so he's got a lot of experience in this field. And, and his background is in manufacturing and uh, aerospace. Uh, so today he, he mostly specializes in uh, sewer and uh, affluent uh, flow metering, uh, in, in particular real-time monitoring and, and control of um, hydropower and, and sewer networks. And our uh, second speaker will be Knut Kalbach from Germany. He is a technical sales manager at uh, SFC Energy, a, a German company. And he's responsible for the business development in the Eastern European markets. But uh, without further ado, I'm going to hand the floor to, to Mark. Okay, hopefully everyone can hear me. Um, so I'm Mark Davis. Uh, MD of uh, Flowline, uh, Flowline uh, Estonia. And as the title says, we're going to talk about uh, real time off grid sewer and surface water flow metering. So I'm going to go fairly quickly uh, through the uh, presentation, but this will be available to download uh, later. It will also have uh, Estonian um, translation as well on the download. So, what are we going to talk about? About well, a little bit about the company. Um, then we'll talk about uh, different types of flow meters, which will lead on to the meters that can be used for surface water and sewer flow monitoring, and that nicely leads into real-time sewer monitoring uh, with remote monitoring. And then off-grid and remote power will be covered by Knut, and then it will come back to me where I'll give you some real application examples of real-time uh, sewer monitoring systems. And I believe we are finishing with a Q&A. So very briefly, uh, who are Flowline? Um, we are located in Tallinn, but we cover Estonia, Latvia and Finland. Uh, we are the local agents or representatives for uh, various manufacturers uh, based in Germany, France and Belgium. Uh, we've been working with these manufacturers for, in some cases, over 30 years. Uh, from Flowline in the UK and also Flowline in Estonia. Um, we've been supplying Estonia since 2012, but I started Flowline Estonia in 2019. And uh, as Jorgen said, I've been involved in the flow metering industry for a long time. Um, and I now uh, basically specialize in uh, difficult applications, uh, which usually involves effluent and sewer monitoring, uh, a lot of retro uh, respective uh, metering. Um, it's uh, very common for uh, really, I would say about 90% of my metering applications are adding flow meters to a network or a system or a process where there wasn't a flow meter before. And that's a very common, very common uh, application for us. And I'm located in Tallinn. Um, so what is a flow meter? Um, if you're involved in the water industry in any uh, way or mean you're going to know uh, you would have come across flow meters but a flow meter measures uh, flow um, liquids gases air or steam we can either measure the uh, the rate um, or in other words the speed of a flow uh, but we can also measure totals so of course if in your house or apartment you will have at least one flow meter usually two. The first one you have is for water, which basically is a mechanical totalizing meter. The second you will have will be for possibly gas. Again, usually mechanical, um, but more electronic uh, gas meters are coming along now. We can basically measure any type of fluid, clean or dirty, corrosive, acidic, um, 
pretty much anything can be measured uh, with the correct type of flow meter. Uh, flow meters are often uh, mechanical. Most of the time these days, they're powered meters. Uh, we also offer what we call non-invasive meters. Uh, that means they clamp on the outside of a pipe or invasive meters that require a pipe to be broken into. Um, you can also have meters for fixed or portable applications. So for flow surveys, etc. So let's look at some examples of uh, ultrasonic flow meters. These are clamp on, so they do not interfere with the flow. You can install and remove them without uh, shutting the, uh, the flow down. And they're suitable for clean water, raw sewage, effluent, even flows with uh, heavily laden silt uh, is not a problem. Again, with the correct type of meter. Um, top picture, very nice clean water supply pipe. Uh, the lower picture shows quite a, an old uh, corroded cast iron pipe. Again, it's not a problem as long as the rust is removed to where we put the probes. And you can see here we have a probe on the left side of the pipe and a probe on the right. But effectively look at each other, look at, each other at about a 45 degree angle to measure the flow. Slightly different, uh, 6.5 meter diameter pipes. These are on a low head uh, hydropower scheme. And you can see there to give you an idea on scale, uh, one of the probes, the other is on the other side of the pipe, the opposite side. Um, and uh, those probes uh, dimension wise, they're about two centimeters square. So that gives you an idea of the size. The picture on the bottom you can see is a buried solid concrete water pipe. And this pipe is full, it's used for uh, supplying water to a very large city. And we are measuring that flow without breaking into the pipe using clamp on ultrasonic probes. After the probes were installed, the entire pipe was buried again. Um, gas flow meters, relevant for water treatment. Um, if you have biogas generation, which you use for generating power, you, move, you will want to measure that. And you can use different types of flow meters for that. The one on the right is an example um, of biogas going to a, a containerized diesel generator. Uh, it's quite a common application. Um, this flow is slow and it's also what we call dirty. It's corrosive, it may be wet as well. But uh, cleaner airflow examples, this is blower air to go to aeration basins for raw sewage treatment. Again, small insertion meters, these are installed without the flows being shut down. And finally, for our full pipe meters, we have a very common flow meter used throughout the world in uh, the water industry for clean and dirty liquids, an electromagnetic or mag meter. Uh, it breaks into the pipe, but once they're installed, they are incredibly reliable, very accurate. They can be direct buried if you want, um, but uh, essentially this is really the gold standard of metering uh, for clean and dirty flows. Uh, sewer, sewer and surface flow meters. So. The main challenge here is, of course, you have a part full pipe or a channel. Um, but if you're going to use a meter for real time control, we'll start to look at some of the requirements. It must have no moving parts. You can't have anything in the flow. It will uh, get cruddy and we'll have a look at some pictures in a minute uh, to look at that. It has to be robust. Uh, IP68 means it can be submerged without being destroyed. That's very important with a sewer network, obviously, is you get surcharging with high flow events. Ideally, it should be low power, so it can be powered uh, by solar power or what could it's going to be talking about. Uh, very wide flow range. Uh, I'll give you some examples um, of the type of flow ranges that we're looking at using the same piece of equipment. And of course, the outputs should be compatible with to your telemetry. So ideally Modbus, uh, Profibus, uh, web enabled as well, which will also give you real time data and also give you diagnostic information, which is very important. So uh, how do we measure flow in a part full pipe? We need two uh, pieces of data, the speed, the velocity of the flow and the wetted area. The wetted area you get from the size and shape of the pipe and how full it is. Uh, we measure that using a look down ultrasonic level sensor. We measure the speed using a radar exactly the same as a police radar gun, the same principle. It measures basically surface velocity. We combine those two, velocity times area, to give the flow. 
Why non-contact? That's a picture of a real flow sensor and a real sewer, and it's completely covered in fat. That's a nice way of saying that it's covered in, but basically it's fat. It means it's not working. So that's no good if you're gonna try and measure real-time flows. That's another common thing, which we just call ragging. This is the flow into a fairly small treatment works with a wetted sensor located at the bottom of the channel. As you can see, um, although the sensor itself may not be covered up, the ragging will have the effect of dragging that cable away. So this is an installed example of our radar. Um, it sits above the channel and it's measuring flow. Um, this particular one outputs to a SCADA system and this one is actually used to control in real time, um, basically a CSO, combined sewer overflow, which uh, at the right uh, flows, it will spill raw sewage into a river, which is perfectly okay. You're allowed to do that, but only in the right circumstances when the flows get to a certain point. So this meter must not fail basically, because you can't have an accidental spill of uh, raw sewage to a river. So what data do we get? Uh, well, this is an example of real-time large sewer data. Um, and what we've also got overlaid there is a rain gauge. So peak flow on this was over 5,000 liters per second. So it's five cubes, five cubic meters a second. Um, obviously a very, very large trunk sewer. And we can see obviously the effects of rainfall. And very importantly, we can see the level and the velocity increase when we have some rainfall mention about needing a wide range that's important because um, we can also use the same equipment to measure low flows and here you can see we're measuring levels down to two millimeters effectively a trickle up to 73 millimeters in a very small pipe for a very small local sewer network uh, the importance of being able to measure these small flows is that you can pick up leakage and infiltration even when you shouldn't have any flow it's very useful so finally, going on to power, um, grid power, great, actually not that reliable in some circumstances. Uh, solar power, we've been using for our real-time uh, flow monitors uh, for many, many years. It is uh, incredibly reliable. Um, we've had systems running for 10 years with no power outages at all. It's very important system specified correctly, and it's in this right geographic location. Um, if you don't have the sun, uh, you're not going to have the power. These particular systems, both of them, will provide 14 days of backup power with no sun. But that's not suitable for um, the more northern climates. So I'm now going to hand over to Knut, who's going to uh, talk to you about off-grid power and uh, how we do that. So... So oh, hello all together. Uh, I hope you can all see my screen now. I'm Kurt Kalbach from the company FFC Energy in, in Germany and uh, we deal with the topic of off-grid power and particularly with the EFOI uh, Pro Fuel Cells that we have in the market uh, for over 20 years now. So just to give you a brief background of our company. Um, as I said, we are on the market for 20 years already, which is um, not really usual in this industry of fuel cells. Um, it's just recently that this topic has become more uh, public and more important to the public. Uh, 20 years ago, um, there wasn't any chance to get uh, the attention we get uh, these days for our fuel cells. So anyway, we've done, uh, we've sold 50,000 fuel cells so far already since uh, 2000. Um, one and um, with 100 million operating hours so we are very experienced in uh, what we do and um, yeah, how our uh, fuel cells work. We are a global operating company, um, our headquarters is in Munich, Germany and uh, we also have a sub in Calgary in uh, the Netherlands and Almelo and in Romania as well. So how did we become successful in such a small uh, niche market? Um, it has something to do with our focus on the customer expectations and um, these expectations, expectations um, change as well over time. 
So we see now that there is a very strong focus on environmentally friendly energy solutions. And as Mark already said, we want to be 100% reliable in our energy supply as well. Uh, we want savings in personal and logistic costs. Um, we want long autonomy. Uh, we work also in the offshore industry. And we want the permanent connectivity and remote monitor all the data that we get from our devices. So this is why we just launched a few weeks ago the EFOI Pro Hybrid Power. It is a system consisting of the EFOI Pro fuel cell here to the left in the picture and um, the EFOI lithium battery. And this is a very strong combination for um, all off-grid power applications. To go a bit more into detail, um, what have we changed um, in comparison to the previous generation? The fuel cell have an, has an extended lifetime and higher, higher power output. We have more flexibility and uh, a better connectivity. The battery um, is developed um, in Munich in our headquarters. Uh, we have our own battery management system and we can charge the lithium battery um, at temperatures below minus 20 degrees or up to minus 20 degrees. And the technology itself is very interesting for high discharge currents as well. Um, just to say we don't have to use the lithium technology, we can use the fuel as well with all other um, ADM or lead batteries as well. Um, and in uh, the combination of both devices is very powerful. We have an intelligent communication between those devices. Um, so the fuel cell always knows the state of charge of the battery and we only recharge whenever it's needed. And this makes the entire system very efficient. So how does the fuel cell work? We need air um, we need the oxygen um, of the air and we need the fuel cartridge with methanol. Then there is a chemical reaction in the fuel cell, in the heart of the fuel cell, which is the stack. And um, in the end, we get uh, electric power and we have waste heat, water vapor, and a bit of CO2 um, that goes out of the device. So it's um, yeah, um, environmentally friendly and very easy to install and to use. So have a look at the components. Um, as I already mentioned, we have the e lithium battery. For the operating options, we use uh, the e app. This is what we do via Bluetooth. We can also use the control panel um, to attach to the device and operate the device. And what we also can do is we can just um, connect the modem and then we can get all the data in our e cloud system. So we see the operating times, the voltage of the battery all remotely from our uh, personal computer back home. And we also have the uh, EFO fuel manager that allows us to connect more fuel cartridges um, from two up to eight. And this brings the entire system to a higher autonomy. Coming to our fuel cartridges, we have three different sizes, the M10, M28 and M60. Um, usually we use the M28 in the industrial applications, but sometimes the M10 is enough and the M60 is only for like very long periods of autonomy. Um, we also have a very high energy density in the methanol. So in this small cartridge down here in the M10, there are 11.1 kilowatt hours of electric energy inside that we uh, transfer um, to electric en energy via our fuel cell. Just to talk in battery capacity, this is about 925 ampere hours of a 12 volt battery. So, and it's yeah, very lightweight, it's only eight kilograms. So these are our current devices that we have. We use the white devices for the leisure industry. It's for caravaning and uh, sailing boats. Um, they have a bit of a lower uh, guaranteed lifetime, 3000 hours. And then we have the Pro series with a bit of a different stack inside and other components. And this, uh, for these devices, we guarantee up to 6000 operating hours. And um, this is what we use in the industrial applications. And the power output um, starts from 40 watts to 125 watts at the most powerful device. Coming to the batteries, we have the E4Li 70 and the 105. This is the uh, capacity from 70 ampere hours and then 105 ampere hours. 
and it comes all to a very um, light weight as well. So we only have 11.8 or 16.3 kilogram, which is uh, way lighter than uh, the actual um, AGM or lead batteries. So which fuel cell um, energy solution, solution suits your application the best? Um, since um, here are all uh, participants from the water companies, um, I will go a bit more into detail of these applications. So one thing that we use is the EFOI Pro cabinet. Um, this is a cabinet where we can install the fuel cell, um, the battery um, devices, and as well the methanol. And then we can use the entire system to monitor the water flow. We also use uh, the EFOI Pro Cube. Um, we can combine it with solar power as well. We use the EFOI Pro Trailer or um, the EFOI Pro Energy Case for mobile applications. And we also deal with uh, customized solutions. So for water level uh, measurement or water flow measurement, um, we have an energy demand of about 10 watts. And if we use the EFOI Pro 900 and two M10 methanol cartridges, this brings us to an autonomy time of three months about without any um, other energy supply. So we only have to go there every three months and change our cartridges. And we can all remote monitor the, the system and see whenever new methanol is needed. So the EFOI Pro cabinet is one of our energy solutions. Um, this is the case where you fit in the fuel cell and the methanol and all the other devices that you need. Um, it's made of steel. We have a temperature range from minus 20 degrees to plus 50 degrees. Uh, we can fit two M10 cartridges in there and the EFOI Lee 70, or we can use any other type of lead battery with about 60 ampere hours. So this is all from my side. I will give over again, uh, give the microphone pretty much to Mark. And if you have any questions, please just feel free to write them in the chatter. We will come back to you later or we will try um, yeah, answer them via email if we don't have time in the end. But uh, probably there will be some time if you have questions for uh, later on um, for us to answer them. So Mark, do you want to take over? I will just stop yeah. my slide here. Thank you. And okay, so hopefully everybody can see my screen. Um, uh, right now we cannot. Oh, sorry, hold on, there you go. Yes, yes perfect. perfect. Yes, excellent, okay. <laughs> so, um, thank you very much, you know, that was very good. Something I would also add, um, the application example where we had three months running on the fuel cell, um, is really a good illustration of what would happen really with winter here, um, because uh, if we combine that with a solar panel for the summer months uh, where we have good light, uh, it would basically mean that uh, you would really only have to revisit a site potentially only once a year um, just to change the fuel cells, uh, fuel cartridges. So uh, why do we monitor in real time? Uh, there's lots of things. Um, Really, it's to one of the sayings that we use uh, is uh, until you monitor, you're guessing. Well, that isn't entirely true, um, but it's it, to actually have real time data in front of you. Uh, you really know what's going on. It's a bit of a truism. Um, but basically, uh, one of the uses for real time uh, monitoring is for billing. And this is done in a number of countries in, in Europe. Um, that individual towns and villages can be billed for their uh, sewage treatment or their sewage flows going out to an external, if you call it, um, treatment works. So we also can monitor, can uh, control and measure um, a uh, sewage uh, treatment network. Um, I'll show one of the examples where an operator can actually uh, control the flows um, before they enter his treatment works. Uh, and if necessary, hold back flows and using the uh, sewer network for uh, retention. Uh, we can also obviously see the effects of rainfall and snow melt and obviously leakage and infiltration. Um, leakage and infiltration studies can be short term using portable battery powered equipment as well. So let's. Uh, yeah. So the first example I give, uh, I'm going to give, this is a network that's been running uh, in northern Italy, a place called South Tyrol, for a number of years, uh, really starting in uh, 2001. 
Um, it's basically a sewer network uh, with lots of small towns and villages and one treatment works. And um, the flows are measured at different measuring stations. There's only over 51. They measure the flow remotely and send that data to a controller in a treatment works. This is the area. Uh, this is actually a screenshot of the controller's screen. And he can click on any of these um, uh, measurement stations and see real time what's happening with the flows. You can also see it's a very mountainous uh, region. Um, but basically all these flows go down a network into a central um, sewage treatment works. The, there are a number of challenges with doing real-time uh, flow measurements, uh, particularly in mountain areas where you've got very small, maybe uh, 150 millimeter, uh, even in some cases 100 millimeter uh, sewer channels, but they're very steep and very fast. So we have flow velocities of four meters a second, not unusual. Uh, obviously, uh, remote locations, and as we said, uh, a lot of them off-grid. Now, in Italy, northern Italy, we don't have a problem with uh, dark winters, so solar power is fine. Um, but again, uh, solar power may not always be the customer's preference. Um, you may not want the solar panel as an obvious indication that there's some equipment there. And we've had this in, uh, in some sites. They really want uh, um, as low profile, literally as low profile as possible. But the requirement for the systems where they had to be very reliable, accurate, and also verifiable. So in other words, every year someone comes along and actually checks the flow readings uh, independently to certify that they are satisfactory and that they can be used for billing purposes. So this is a typical installation. Um, again, fairly relatively small solar panels, a very, very small chamber, as you can see, uh, drop down onto an existing uh, sewer. Uh, you can see there the radar flow meter. Um, the, the other cable to the left is the look down ultrasonic uh, level sensor. So again, operating since 2001, uh, used for real-time control. Um, and again, the controller can select an individual measuring site. There are powered uh, pen stocks, control gates on each of these measuring sites. And he, he can set a maximum flow and leave the system to do a closed loop uh, flow control. So the next one is quite an interesting uh, uh, application. This is in Brussels. This uh, is called Flowbrew, uh, operating again since 2001. The data is sent uh, to via uh, GPRS to uh, DataNet. This data is publicly available. So I went onto the websites this morning and downloaded some real-time data, which I'm going to show you. So anyone anywhere in the world can log into flowbrew.ee.be and have a look at what is happening in Brussels with their sewer network and their rivers, uh, rainfall collectors, etc. It's quite interesting um, that they make all this publicly available. But this is the what you get when you log in. Uh, each of these uh, little points is a measurement point, and it's either rainfall, uh, wastewater. There are quality measurements as well. Um, and also surface water. So we, I had a look at one of the surface water uh, drains. That's what you get when you click on any of those points. Uh, you get a representation of what the channel is. So in this case, it's a circular pipe. Uh, you can also see actual site pictures. And again, this is used for verification. Um, you know, has the channel become blocked or overgrown compared to when it was first installed? You can see there typical surface, uh, surface water flows. And there's a rain uh, collection meter as well, uh, which is here. And this is the data. So I downloaded this today. Uh, we are measuring level rainfall, which we can see um, there was a little bit of rainfall here and its influence on the flow. And this is up to today, 24th. And we can see debit, which is uh, French for flow. Uh, peaking at 15.15 litres per second. So it's uh, a nice example there with some really good data that anyone can access. So really in summary, uh, regarding flows, pretty much anything can be measured. Um, uh, it may not always be easy, but pretty much anything 
and can be measured. Um, power can be available, as we said, uh, either grid power or solar or fuel cell or a combination of all three, in fact. Um, you need reliable maintenance-free systems if you're going to be doing real-time control. That's very important. Also, the ability to upgrade and improve. Um, you may want to add things uh, later on uh, to systems, such as maybe uh, redundant level sensors or, or quality um, measurement systems. Um, and as a supplier, all I would say to potential customers is uh, give us as much information as you have. Um, it's, uh, it's always handy. And the other thing I always say is challenge your suppliers. Um, we like difficult challenges. Uh, they make things interesting. So thank you very much. I think I'm gonna hand you back now um, and I'll uh, just end on our final uh, screen. So thank you very much and uh, ask any questions over Q&A. Okay.